Shall we pray? Our Father, we know the propensity when we come to familiar text is to beginning to check out that uh, we know these things. We pray that that won't happen today, that you will cause us to focus afresh, deeper upon these truths, that you will give us greater insight and deeper conviction and greater joy of who the Lord Jesus Christ is as our Lord and Savior. We ask the blessing upon your word for your honor and glory. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. May be seated. Please turn to the book of Micah 5, and we will read that again. And, and then turn to our text, John 1, and we'll read the first four verses. Micah, page 778, and then John 1, page 886. This is God's word. But you, O Bethlehem Ephrathah, who are too little to be among the clans of Judah, from you shall come forth for me one who is to be ruler in Israel, whose coming forth is from old, from days of eternity. John 1. In the beginning was the word, and the word was with God, and the word was God. He was in the beginning with God. All things were made through him, and without him was not anything made that was made. In him was life, and the life was the light of men. The light shines in the darkness, and the darkness has not overcome it. For these two Sundays in Advent, we'll be meditating on John 1, and you might say that, well, John 1 seems to be a strange place to go when you think of Christmas. John's gospel is different than the other three gospels, and especially in how it opens. It doesn't open with baby Jesus in a manger, and in fact, it, it omits the birth account. It um, doesn't speak of Jesus' baptism or his temptations. There's nothing of the Lord's Supper or Gethsemane or his ascension. There's nothing of demons being cast out. There's no parables. But perhaps the most significant way in which Gospel of John is different than the others is it focuses on the pre-existence of Jesus Christ. How does Matthew's Gospel begin? It begins with Abraham. How does Luke's Gospel begin? It begins with the parents of John the Baptist. But how does John's Gospel begin? It goes back to eternity and says that Jesus Christ, the Son of God, has never had a beginning. John 1.1 1, 1 is telling us, yes, there's the truth of the incarnation. Jesus was born human flesh in Bethlehem, historical fact, but it's, that's not the beginning of Christ's existence when he came to be. Parents who sing happy birthday to Jesus on Christmas morning need to nuance that so the children realize that this is not the beginning of the existence of the Son of God. John is intentional here in his gospel, these first five verses to show us that Jesus is God. And then the rest of the gospel is going to be evidence after evidence after evidence that Jesus is God. And so the gospel will conclude with these things are written so that you might know that Jesus is God. As we hear in the confession of Thomas, when he sees the resurrected, the Lord Jesus Christ, you are my Lord and my God. So today, let's reflect on verses 1 through 3 here of the Gospel of John and ask, who is this baby born in Bethlehem? John is telling us that Christ is eternal. He has always existed before anything created. Christ is creator. He has always existed apart from anything created. Those two little words, before and apart, could summarize these verses which leads then to John's conclusion, Jesus Christ is God. Who is this baby being born in Bethlehem? He's Christ eternal. He's always existed before anything created. Look at verse 1. Christ existed before the beginning of time. In the beginning was the word, the beginning. 
the word that's translated in the beginning can have two different senses. It can, it can refer in the sense of time to the beginning of a ball game, the beginning of a semester, the beginning of the new year. And so, yes, John is using it in that way in the sense of time. And so what would be the beginning that he's referring to? Not in the beginning of Jesus' ministry, such as in Mark 1. Not the beginning, even of Genesis 1, 1, and then coming forward thousands of years to our time. John is saying, if you can go back in your mind to the very beginning of energy and light and the very first beginning of existence of anything, Jesus Christ already was. In the beginning was, and that's not just that copula, that weak connecting verb. This is a very strong assertion of existence. He already was. It's describing his eternal, unchanging being. You get the idea if you read it. In the beginning, the word was. There was never a time when the word was not. If you go back to eternity past, Christ was already was. You go back further, he already was. He, go back further, he already was. John 17, 5, Jesus prays that his glory again would be revealed, that he has had with the Father before the world was. Colossians 1, 17, he was before all things. He's from all eternity. When the first created things came to be, the word already was. Absolute eternity of being is being asserted here for the word in precise and strong language. Absolute eternity. God the Son, the word, comes before all things. He's the beginning of all things. You stretch your imagination back as far as you can. And Christ already was. Christ existed before the beginning of time. And then John wants us to see more. He, he wants us to see that Christ existed before anything created. Keep your finger here and look back to Micah 5.2, which we read. Micah, the prophecy, tells us two things. It tells us where the Messiah is going to be born, first of all. You remember the wise men when they came to King Herod, and they asked the king, where is he that's been born king of the Jews? And he consulted the chief priests and scribes, and they answered correctly. Well, Micah tells us he's to be born in Bethlehem. And this was 700 years before the birth of Christ. That would be like someone in Europe in the 1300s putting down a prophecy of the town where you would be born. Bethlehem was not chosen as the birth of Messiah because it was a grand place. It's the word, it's translated here is, but you are small, you are insignificant, you're a pittance. That's the way of the Lord. It, he doesn't often choose the glamorous and the large and the successful. That's not his ways. He tells us, don't despise the day of small things. In Mary's Magnificat, it's, he chooses those that are low and his purposes of election. Paul writes in 1 Corinthians 1.27, he doesn't often choose the wise and the powerful and the people that have it all together according to this world. Not often. He chooses the weak and the broken and people like us so that he might receive the greater glory. Micah's prophecy is talking about the place where Messiah is to be born. Yes, insignificant Bethlehem, but he's also prophesying something else. He's prophesying who will be born. And the person to be born in Bethlehem is the eternal one. He tells us that in two ways. He says the one to be born is from of old or is going forth or from of old, long ago. When this is used of God in his name, it's, it's from everlasting, Habakkuk 1.12. He's referred in this way as the eternal God, Deuteronomy 33.27. But again, he's going to be from days of eternity. I like that translation of the New American it's, it's better, it's stronger than the NIV or the ESV, though they're not wrong. It could be translated ancient days or ancient times, and that sense of David's line was a lengthy line. But Micah 5.2 isn't talking about a long past. He's not talking about Messiah's line of David being a lengthy time. Not even if you go back to Genesis 3.15 and Adam and Eve. He's not saying it was a long time since then. He's not looking, past. He's not looking back and saying it was a long time in the past. 
He's not looking forward and he's not saying there's going to be a long time looking forward. Once Messiah comes and establishes his kingdom, it's going to be a long kingdom forever. And it certainly is not saying that God decreed this from eternity. God decrees all things from eternity. It wouldn't make any sense to pick out this one and God decrees all things. No, he's speaking of the person to come is the eternal one. God himself will come. The everlasting God is to be born in Bethlehem. Old Testament scholar Dr. Walke says when this phrase is used in theological context, it can be translated from eternity. Like Psalm 90 verse 2, before the mountains were brought forth or ever you had formed the earth and the world, from everlasting to everlasting, you are God. That's what Micah is prophesying here. The paradox, the most insignificant place you can think of, Bethlehem. There, the most preeminent person you can think of, God himself, the eternal God, is to come and to be born and to establish his kingdom. God is announcing through Micah that Messiah, the Christ, the eternal one, is to be born in Bethlehem. Just like Jerusalem of old owed its existence to King David who was born there. The new Jerusalem owes its existence to Christ, the son of David, who was born there as well. But of Christ's kingdom, there will be no end, no space. We wait for that day when every knee will bow to him. Who is this baby born in Bethlehem? He is Christ eternal. He has always existed before anything created. John tells us more. He is the Christ, the creator. He existed apart from anything created. Verse 3. He wants us to, he wants us to grasp this very clearly. Not only is Christ eternal, but he was never made Christ is the creator. He was not created. He is the beginning. The word beginning, as we looked at already, yes, it has the sense of time, but it has another sense, and it can be used in this way. It can be used in the sense of cause or origin. Something has its beginning. Who began that story? What were the issues that began World War II? It can have a sense of cause. It can have a sense of the origin. Which is it? Is Jesus the beginning in the sense of time, or is he the beginning in the sense of cause of all things? Gospel of John often uses words that you could translate either way. Not that you pick and choose, but that you combine them. John has this beautiful sense of writing so that you take both senses. You get a fuller picture. Jesus Christ is not only was at the beginning of time. Jesus Christ is the beginning in the sense that he is the cause of all things. He's the beginning of all things. He's the origin of all things. Nothing exists apart from Jesus Christ. There never was a thing, not a thing, not a molecule that's existed apart from Jesus Christ. A virus, a star, everything depends upon Jesus Christ for its existence. He has created it all. Nothing has ever been created apart from Jesus Christ. And not only has Jesus Christ created all things, but the scripture tells us he's also sustaining all things by his powerful word, even today. This is the Lord Jesus Christ that is ruling your life in the times that you feel things are out of control. This is the Lord Jesus Christ who has brought everything into existence by his word. And who is upholding the stars of the universe and he's upholding your life. Christ is the creator. He was not created. He's the beginning of it all, the cause of it all. And then John again repeats it in verse 3, almost like a commentary on verse 1. He's the creator. He's not created. Twice he says it. He says it in the negative. He says it in the positive. You see it in verse 3. All things were made through him. There's the positive and here's the negative. And without him was not anything made that was made. The positive. 
All that was made came into being through Jesus Christ. Literally, all things came into being through him and apart from him. Not even one thing that has come into being has come into being. Everything that has been made, it's a perfect sense that the continuing existence of created things, what you see around us in this world, continues to owe its existence to the Lord Jesus Christ just as much as on that very first day of creation. And it is an intentional contact back to Genesis 1.1. In that beginning... It was the word of God, and God said, and there was light, and there was life. So too, in John 1, 1, Christ has come, and there is life, and there is, verse 4, there is light, verse 4. So the Christian church has professed the scriptures, I believe in one Lord Jesus Christ, the only begotten Son of God, begotten of the Father before all worlds, God of God, light of light, very God of very God, begotten, not made, being of one substance with the Father, by whom all things were made. Nicene Creed. The positive. But then the negative. The word owes its existence to none. He's not created. In a recent World Magazine, there was a recent poll, discovered that 60% of evangelicals were confused whether Jesus Christ was created or not. 60%. Verse 3 says, nothing has been made except what Christ made. Christ could not make himself. Therefore, he's the creator of God. Of all, he is God. If he's made, everything that's been made has been made by Christ and he couldn't make himself, he is God. Dr. Lucas tells the wonderful account in Britain of the Jehovah's Witness who was standing at the front door and who had already rung the doorbell. And he was reading John 1, 3, preparing his statements to give on the beliefs of the Jehovah's Witness. As he was reading verse 3, the Holy Spirit turned the lights on. If all things were created, everything that was created is from Jesus Christ, and he couldn't create himself, he is God. Who is this baby born in Bethlehem? John often does that. He gives the negative, he gives the positive, so that you see them both from different angles. John 14, 6 is another example, isn't it? Jesus says the positive, I am the way, the truth, and the life, the positive, and the negative, and no one comes to the Father but through me. He is the only way of salvation. There is no other way. So you put your trust and faith in him alone, and you will be saved. All who come to him, he will never be driven away. Who is this baby born in Bethlehem? Christ is eternal. He's always existed before anything created. He is Christ, the creator. He's existed apart from anything created. The conclusion, verse 1, Jesus Christ is God. The word was God. Eternally, Christ has been an equal person within the Godhead. He is fully God. There's one God and three persons, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, and each is fully God. There was a heresy, which means false teaching. There was a false teaching early in the church of Jesus Christ regarding the person of Jesus Christ, and it was spreading in the early church. It took many, many years to address it. It took a partial truth, it took a truth, the unity of God. We believe that there is one God, a fundamental truth of Scripture, but wrongly concluded, therefore, that God the Father is the only God and that Christ is not deity. He's the first of created creatures. He's superior to everyone in position and honor, but he is nevertheless a creature. There was a time when he did not exist. God the Father brought him into existence. This was taught by Arius, a pastor in Alexandria, Egypt. And it was alarming because it was, this false teaching was spreading throughout the the church. 
part in, because it was put to music. The rhymes were put to music. It was said that even the dock hands unloading fish in Alexandria were singing these tunes. It was very catchy and was spreading. And it was similar to their pagan backgrounds of uh, having superior gods and all the ladders of inferior gods. Arius said of Christ, there was once when he was not. But the Lord raised up a man, a deacon from Alexandria, Athanasius, who insisted that Arius' teaching was heresy and it would leave us with no savior. Christ is God, he's preexisted through time, he's eternal God. And also in God's providence, the Lord raised up the emperor of Rome, now a professing Christian, Constantine. July 4, in the year 325, he's, Constantine summoned together 318 bishops of the church to compose a creed to address this issue and address it biblically on the person of Jesus Christ. Some of these bishops that gathered together to, to address this issue came crippled and bearing the marks in their own bodies of persecution. Only 12 years before, the Roman Empire was still persecuting Christians. There was a bishop that came with his eye out because he, of his physical persecution for holding to the name of Christ. Another bishop came with his hands burned from red-hot irons. And these bishops came to address this issue from Scripture. Two months of work, and they composed this creed, which we still profess, the Nicene Creed, confirmed again in 381 of the Council of Constantinople. Regarding Jesus Christ, I believe in one Lord Jesus Christ, the only begotten Son of God, begotten of the Father before all worlds, God of God, light of light, very God of very God, begotten, not made, being of one substance with the Father, by whom all things were made. That's John 1. John is stating here, the Word was God. And it's in a position here of emphasis. John isn't willing to say that the Word eternally existed with God as a fellow co-fellow. He wants to go on and say, there's more to that. The Word himself is God. Why would John say it this way? Why would he use the, this metaphor of the Word was God? Some have suggested that he's borrowing from Greek philosophy, and certainly at that time, Greek philosophy, the Word or Logos is certainly part of Greek philosophy. Philo and Plato, Socrates and others, and by the time John had written his gospel, the Christian church had spread through the Roman Empire, so the church was mostly Gentile. They'd be familiar with Greek philosophy. In Greek, the word logos is the principle of reason that's in the universe. It's the principle that you form onto matter and constitutes even the soul in man. The logos is the center of Greek philosophical writings. The mind of God, you might say. But John is talking about using the word was God. He's, he's saying more the, that it wasn't just the mind of God that came to earth. He's talking about the person of God came to earth. So he's not borrowing from Greek philosophy. He's using the word was God in the sense of the Old Testament, the Hebrew scriptures that speak of the word of God. And how do the Old Testament scriptures speak of the word of God? The Old Testament scriptures, when they speak of the word of God, it's God who's coming in action, in creation, for example, in Psalm 33, 6, by the word of the Lord, the heavens were made. Genesis 1, 1, God said, and there was light. God said, and there were animals. God said. It's the word of God as he's working in creation. The word of the Lord comes when, as an expression of revelation, when God is appearing to a prophet as he did to Isaiah. The word of the Lord came to Isaiah, Isaiah 38, 4. God is coming in revelation to reveal himself, to reveal truth. Or the word of God is, is often a strong tower. 
Psalm 107, verse 20, he sent forth his word and healed them. The word of God in protection, the word of God in deliverance. The Old Testament expression of the word of God is a rich and deep truth. Of God and his power of creation and deliverance and protection and revelation revealing himself. And John 1 is saying, the word was God. Christ has come to reveal God, the second person of the Trinity, who is truly and fully God. The eternal word has come and taken on flesh. The Lord Jesus Christ has come to reveal God and to accomplish our redemption. The infinite became the finite. The eternal entered time and became subject to its conditions. The immutable, the unchangeable, became changeable. The invisible became visible. The creator became created. The sustainer of all became dependent. The almighty became infirm. God became man that he may die and by his death destroy the works of the devil and take away our sin. John Murray. Can you fathom that? The mystery at Christmas, we are celebrating the incarnation of the eternal God. The virgin shall conceive and you shall call his name Emmanuel, God with us, Matthew 1, 23. That's what it's all about. When man looked upon Jesus, they actually saw with their eyes one who was truly God, Machen. You see, it's all, it's, it's all one package. You can't have redemption unless it was God himself who came and took on human flesh and went to the cross, who took our sins upon him and took the wrath that our sins deserve so that we might be forgiven. And the eternal God who's obeyed his own law so that he might give us his righteousness, that he will pardon and forgive and justify all who come to him in faith. Richard Jeffries in his book, Beavis, the story of a boy, describes the little boy looking through a book and on the crucifixion of Jesus Christ. He was becoming quite affected as he reflected on the suffering of Christ as he reflected on the suffering of the nails being pounded into his hands, as he reflected on the suffering of Christ, the spear that went through his side, as he reflected on the the Savior being beaten and humiliated and dying. Little boy turned the page, and with a tear he said, If God had been there, he wouldn't have let them do it. But that's the whole point. God was there. It was God incarnate coming to lay down his life willingly and lovingly so that you might be saved. So that as you put your hope and trust in him and him alone, he pardons you and receives you into his family. It was, God was there. Who is this baby born in Bethlehem? Who is Jesus Christ to you? That's your life's most important question, and it's inescapable, you must answer it. If a person says, well, he was only a a good man, well then, You're not under any particular danger if you choose to forget him or ignore him. But if he truly is who he claims to be and who the Bible reveals him to be and whom the churches has professed him to be, that he is God incarnate, then you must yield your life to him. You must come to him and trust in him as your Lord and Savior. You must bring your heart to him and worship him with all of your heart and with all of your soul and with all of your mind. There is no other way of salvation 
other than God incarnate. No, not all roads lead to heaven. No, Jesus has told us this. God has told us this, God incarnate. How could one who is not God, who is merely a creature, save a multitude of sinners, even save one sinner? How could a creature satisfy the debt that is owed to an infinite God? See, Christianity is not like every other religion. Every other religion are ways that people are trying to attain to merit, are trying to attain to God's approval. It's only Christianity that says God has come to us. It's only Christianity, it's the incarnation that says you cannot save yourself, so God has come to save you. So that all who put their trust in Christ will be saved. When's the last time the wonder of the incarnation really gripped you? (laughs) That's what we're celebrating. This isn't just a generic peace and goodwill. It's not just the birth of a baby who's going to become a great man, a great teacher. This is the entering into the human condition of the eternal God. In Jesus Christ, we are face to face with the God-man. He was in the beginning. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. Shall we pray? Almighty God and Heavenly Father, if we believe these things it's all, at all, it's because you have opened our minds to understand these things, and we acknowledge that, and we worship you for that. Our Father, we confess that we, we still need to understand this more. We can't wrap our minds around this. We can't wrap our hearts around this. It's too big. It's too good. It's... This is the best news ever. Thank you that God has come to save us. We respond in gratitude. We respond in worship. We praise you for the plan of redemption and for our Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ. We pray that he would be honored in our lives. We pray in Jesus' name.